even though China is the only communist country among your six, and it's not very communist anymore, the College Board will still often ask questions about the theories of communism. Basically, Marxist theory, which is the underlying premise of communist theory, if not in China, communist practice, uh, is that it is the structure of the economy that determines the governmental structure and that really rules uh, the organization of the country. Lenin uh, developed some important corollaries to that. Uh, he had to deal with the fact that communism was not, in fact, progressing, as Marx had predicted, in the industrialized countries of Western Europe, and come up with an excuse for introducing communism in Russia, which was not particularly industrialized. So he came up with this theory that imperialism was the final stage of capitalism, and it was the existence of colonies that had made possible the survival of capitalism. Uh, he also rejected Marx's notion uh, that parties would, that excuse me, that revolutions uh, would be started by the working class in a mass movement. Uh, Lenin introduced the concept of a vanguard party, basically usually a small group of intellectuals, often not working class, who would lead and direct and really control the revolution. And this was this concept of guardianship, the guardianship of the proletariat by intellectuals like Lenin, pictured here. Mao made some important additions to communism. The most significant was that he saw the peasantry as a major revolutionary force. Um, he also returned in a somewhat different way to Marx's notion of mass mobilization. Uh, China had masses, numbers of people, uh, and he thought that it was the ability to generate action by these large numbers of people that would make a revolution possible. Uh, he integrated that with Lenin's notion of the vanguard uh, with the doctrine of the mass line, which was basically the idea that a revolutionary leadership would listen to the people. It was a two-way street of communication. Uh, and then... Uh, develop policies which would be communicated down through the party structure to the people. In theory, it was supposed to be a two-way communication. In practice, uh, this usually involved the party telling people what to think. So let me talk a little bit about Chinese political culture. A lot of this is probably a review of the history section, uh, but it's it's interesting that in China, as in Russia, uh, there are certain elements of political culture that are truly ancient, that go back way before the creation of the current government. So China, China's culture was defined by Confucianism, a really more philosophical system than a religion that highly valued order, harmony, hierarchy. Uh, rulers were seen as enjoying a mandate from heaven, but, and this is an interesting corollary, uh, rulers who failed, lost wars, uh, were overthrown, were seen as having lost the mandate for heaven. So this isn't quite the divine right of rulers. Uh, and the notion that rulers could fall from power is something that kind of haunts Chinese leaders. China is a very ethnocentric uh, country. It does have ethnic cleavages. I'll talk about that in a minute. But but 92% of the population is Han Chinese. There's a strong sense of cultural identity, even cultural superiority. China has a long history of having to fight off foreign domination, resisting imperialism, uh, the foreign uh, control over China in the 19th century uh, hit that country very hard. It was the Middle Kingdom used to thinking of itself as the most powerful country, certainly in its region or even in the world, uh, and a desire to assert China's independence and leadership in the world remains you know, an important element in political culture and a source of legitimacy for Chinese rulers. If they're seen as being pushed around on the international stage, they're going to get into trouble. By the way, a very similar attitude exists in Russia and helps explain some of the uh, bloviating from Vladimir Putin. Now, on top of that, you have a layer of values from the Maoist era collectivism, the idea of, of communal ownership of property, active participation by the people in the struggle while following the guardian's lead. And, and Mao never really quite figured out how to balance these. In fact, you could argue that he fluctuated wildly between control from above and then trying to generate excitement 
among the masses. Um, this instability, by the way, was quite un-Chinese, uh, and his successors have been very determined not uh, to follow his lead in this regard. The mass line is a source of party people communication. I'm going to be talking about, more about that in a minute. Egalitarianism is an ideal, and by the way, China has become significantly less egalitarian in recent years. Uh, local initiative was encouraged as long as it followed the party line. And by the way, this is a, another a dialectic that has remained problematic in Chinese politics, because on the one hand, there's a recognition uh, that grassroots change is often the most effective form of change uh, and a fear of local initiative and balancing these two is, continues to be an issue in Chinese politics. But basically, under Mao, ideology was the primary source of political legitimacy, and that is what changed with Deng Xiaoping and his successors. Uh, they never renounced communism, and in fact, the latest leader of China uh, is, if anything, stepping up the Maoist rhetoric. Nevertheless, the reality is that China has pursued what is sometimes referred to as a socialist market economy. I would probably call it a corporatist economy with uh, state control of, the, of much of the economy and much of the economic growth uh, lining the, the pockets of important party officials. Uh, but basically, uh, the individuals are encouraged to pursue wealth and individualism in that sense is now allowed or even encouraged. Criticism of the government is not. Uh, every new Chinese leader raises hopes that he is going to be a reformer. I've become a little cynical about this in my old age. Uh, virtually all of them end up embracing at least some economic reforms, reforms that are seen as necessary to continue China's economic growth. None of these leaders has embraced political reform or political openness. Instead, they see economic performance as well as China's position in the world, but really much more economic performance as the source of political legitimacy. China has some significant political cleavages. Ethnic cleavages uh, are important on the borders, and China does face a long-term dilemma. Actually, I wonder if this 8% is still correct. I didn't check that when I um, made this slide. Because of China's uh, strict population control policies, I suspect that the percent of China's population uh, that is Muslim on its western frontiers is larger. But this group is really not very significant uh, to day-to-day life in China. These areas are repressed from the center, but don't play much of a role uh, in the Chinese economy or in Chinese uh, politics. However, the cleavage between rural and urban is extremely important and becoming more severe. Uh, China actually has, uh, is extremely unequal in terms of the Gini coefficient. You've probably run across that by now. If you haven't, you need to know it. Uh, and the inequality in China has increased dramatically in the last 30 years. Uh, to be the 29th most unequal nation in the world, that's a, that's, I mean, India, for instance, ranks much higher. That is, it is much less unequal. And it's not a particularly equal society. Another cleavage that I think could become very significant for China uh, is young versus old. Now, China faces a demographic crisis. Uh, its one-child policy has dramatically reduced population growth. Uh, it has, I don't actually have statistics on this, but uh, it is skewed significantly toward males. Uh, selective abortion has been sex selective abortion. And I think that there's a real question mark over China. What's going to happen in a society where uh, there are significantly more young men than young women, but you also have the problem of how uh, a, an increasingly elderly population is going to be supported. Uh, China had basically had a family-based social welfare system. It really hasn't been replaced with a state welfare system, and that's a challenge that's going to face them. Uh, students have often been unhappy with the authoritarian uh, Chinese government, and periodically there have been major student revolts. Right now, uh, although there is some student activism, um, most of the rebellion takes place on social media sites, which is probably why China's been cracking down on them in a lot, uh, in major way. But music, um, 
you know, much of the rebellion, in fact, takes a non-political form. It's safer dress, music, uh, challenging your parents' values, whatever. It seems to be an easier way for the youth to rebel than something that would get them run down by tanks in Tiananmen Square. Uh, just a term worth knowing. The sent down generation is a term for people who were sent down to the countryside during the Cultural Revolution and really deprived of their opportunity to get an education. Interestingly enough, the new leader of China, Xi Jinping, and by the way, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, and I've heard it pronounced different ways, uh, was temporarily a member of that. His father was a noted revolutionary uh, who got into trouble during the Cultural Revolution and was then rehabilitated. Uh, exactly how this plays out isn't certain. It's been interesting how much Maoist rhetoric uh, Xi has been using, but he is also one of the generation that suffered personally from the uh, upheavals of the Cultural Revolution. And I don't see him pursuing social revolution with any real enthusiasm. Uh, by the way, this is an interesting uh, chart that I just found on The Economist showing GDP per person. You can see uh, how wealth is concentrated uh, in the uh, in the urban areas and how much income inequality there is. It's a little bit hard to read, but it's it's interesting if you look at it. Okay, one of the things that's kind of strange about trying to teach China in comparative government is that the distinction between politics and institutions, which more or less works in our other countries, really doesn't make a whole lot of sense in China. So to some extent, this actually is almost your institutional lecture. I mean, you will hear about uh, you know, the various uh, legislatures, et cetera, but they are wholly owned subsidiaries of the Communist Party. So if you understand Communist Party workings, you really understand Chinese political institutions as well as Chinese politics. Understanding how the Chinese party system works, how Chinese politics works, is very complicated. It is not an open system, and there is an entire uh, school of academics called China and diplomats and analysts, China watchers, you know, who pay very close attention to things like, you know, who sits next to whom at the banquet, and in what order do people march out onto the stage. Uh, and who gets invited to what meeting. I do not know China at that level, but it is not an open society. Uh, it's And it is driven probably more than anything else by what the Chinese call Guangxi. This is basically a personal connections. And of course, it's an important in a lot of the countries that we're looking at, um, but it's really risen to an art form. Nomenklatura is a term you should use. It's actually a Russian ter term, uh, but it means that cadres, members of the party are chosen, or, or I should say higher party officials are chosen from the lower levels of the party hierarchy, very much an internal system. You know, how one rises in the party, good connections or guangxi, competence does matter. And and often people rise in the party because they manage a region competently. Uh, so it's not a com it's not a completely corrupt system in that sense. But at any rate, nomenclature is an indication that there's very little electing that goes on. Uh, this is uh, promotion from within. There are significant factions within the Chinese Communist Party. Now, once upon a time, the main factions and really what I would teach students, the conservatives, uh, it's kind of a misnomer because I'm actually talking about the Maoists, people who were very nervous about these market reforms, uh, the loss of control that might be entailed. We might even call them left wingers, but in the Chinese context, they were more conservative, uh, and they haven't had. They, I mean, they they've been able to uh, reduce the speed of change, and change does not tend to happen quickly in China anyway. But they have not been in control of the government really since Mao, who himself was really not very conservative, was always shaking things up. The reformers, and that may be a misnomer as well, but that's the term that's often used, have basically supported market reforms, capitalist changes, although, you know, not complete capitalism by any means, but favor very tight political control. And every Chinese leader since Mao has fit into this category. With each new leader, there's speculation that at last we're going to have a more liberal leader. None has turned out to be especially liberal. And as for liberals, there have been some. Uh, and when the Chinese economy began to open up with Deng Xiaoping, 
there were some signs that the the politics would would open up as well and there were in particular significant student movements in 1989, uh, this broke into a rebellion. It was put down brutally. Uh, and since then, uh, basically, the government has moved very quickly to stomp on anything that it sees as a revolt. In recent years, we've seen some new factional divides arise. Uh, and the two, and actually, your textbook talks about these a little bit differently. The princelings, it mentions, these are basically the privileged sons of the revolution. Their fathers may have, or grandfathers at this point, may have gone on the long march and starved with Mao, but they have grown up uh, with privileges, with lots of money, uh, and preserving those privileges is a very important objective for them. And uh, Xi Jinping very much fits in this category. Uh, your book talks about members of the Youth Communist League, which is kind of the Hu Jintao faction. I think a more up-to-date way of looking at this would really be uh, that you have uh, individuals who have risen through, you know, more the, the power system in Beijing versus individuals who established regional leadership. And those are the ones more commonly associated with Hu Jintao. There was a huge purging of a figure named Bao Zhulai, who still actually seems to have some behind-the-scenes influence. That gets more complicated than you need to know. But right now, the centralizers seem to be on top. Okay, the formal organization of the Communist Party, and this is getting kind of close to the institutional side. Again, you have this notion of democratic centralism with not very much democrat democracy and a lot of centralism, guardianship, the idea that a cadre of experienced party leaders uh, will rule over the masses, listening to them via the mass line, but mostly telling them what to do. Uh, the party is completely hierarchically organized, uh, village, township, county, province, nation, uh, as I'll mention a little bit later, only at the county level and in the villages are there elections. Everybody else is appointed from the level below. About 5% of the population uh, is a member of the Communist Party, and a very important change in recent years uh, has been that the the party's been very much open to business leaders, technocrats, engineers, etc. It used to be that you had to have good proletariat or peasant uh, pedigrees, if you will, to get into the Communist Party. Now you pretty much have to be somebody uh, who's seen as good at making money. So every five years, there's a National Party Congress, more than 2,000 delegates. This is a huge dog and pony show. All it really does is rubber stamp. Uh, it validates decisions, and it's responsible for taking them out into the countryside. It also, however, elects the Central Committee, although this is usually pretty much a done deal. Now, the Central Committee is important. This is around 340 members, and they meet every year. Sometimes they meet twice a year in what's called a plenum. And they, perhaps their most important job, elect the Politburo or Standing Committee. But again, election is kind of a misnomer. Generally speaking, uh, these are, have been pretty much determined in advance by the more powerful members uh, of the party, and in particular, the Politburo. The Politburo has 24 members. The Standing Committee has seven. These are the people who rule China. You're going to learn uh, other institutional positions when you get to institutions, but these are the important guys. They meet in secret. Uh, and exactly who gets to be in the standing committee is probably the most important piece of information that China watchers get, and they watch it very closely. Uh, just a small note in case it would show up on your test. There are some Democratic parties allowed. They're tightly controlled. Uh, they serve some advisory role as uh, more and more the wannabe capitalists are invited into the Communist Party, these parties actually have a less significant role. Again, the most important thing to understand is that the government and party are parallel institutions and the party is in control. Uh, and that point will be reinforced when you get, get to institutions. Okay, the third plenum. It's interesting uh, that as a new leader comes to power in China. And there have been a series of generations. You talked about that, I'm sure, when you did your history section. Traditionally, the third plenum, the meeting you know, of the 340, uh, is the one where big 
policy changes are announced. At this point, the new leader has consolidated his power, is ready to present his program. Uh, and so the fact that there was going to be a, there was a third plenum in November means that there's been a lot of attention to what's going on in China in the last couple months. It's a good time to be watching China. So just for an example, it was in the third plenum in 1978 that Deng Xiaoping announced the opening of China's economy, the market reforms, the acceptance of the household responsibility system, land reforms that were basically happening spontaneously in the countryside. He decided to pretend that they were his idea. Uh, there's some dispute about just how radical he was really being in 1978, but it was a very important year. Uh, in 1993, the third plenum announced a socialist market economy. That was pretty much a recognition of reality. Nevertheless, when terms change, it indicates a movement in Chinese politics. Those terms are very carefully selected, even if to us they sometimes seem rather opaque. Uh, so, again, oops, I think I left a line in from a previous slide. So, in November 2013, Xi Jinping had his third plenum. Here you see him in the center uh, with the other members of the standing committee, all in their black suits and red ties, or mostly red ties. Uh, notice it's a highly orchestrated event with a lot of staging. This is very much a media event, at least at the end. Media are not invited to ask questions at the meeting himself. Okay, let me return to this idea of the mass line because it is somewhat unique to Chinese politics, although actually Lenin and Marx, or Lenin talked about it a little bit, but it was Mao who really delivered, uh, developed it into an art form, if you will. The mass line, in theory, means that the leaders of the party listen to the people, they find out what they're worried about, but basically... Uh, although they communicate that information up through the party hierarchy, supposedly. Much more importantly, uh, the position of the party is communicated down through the party hierarchy to the people. In Maoist times, uh, there were uh, political education meetings constantly at one's place of employment. One of the reasons, uh, at least I've read, that people in China have, have welcomed the end of Maoism is that they don't have to go to as many meetings. Uh, I worked in the Pentagon for many years. I can really sympathize with that. I don't like meetings either. In the Cultural Revolution, the whole mass line idea really ran amok. Mao, I believe, was a, was a romantic. Uh, he thought revolutions had to renew themselves, and he basically wanted uh, the people to speak out, to criticize their leaders. He felt that the Communist Party needed shaking up. It turned into mass chaos. Uh, and if there's anything that the leadership of the Communist Party in China agrees on is that they don't want to do that again. Uh, so after Mao, you have a series of what the Chinese in their obscure way call rectification campaigns. I'm sure it's a different word in Chinese, but that's how it's translated. In, under Deng Xiaoping, these were the four modernizations, industry, agriculture, science, and the military. Uh, there were suggestions from liberals who were encouraged by this new approach that the fifth modernization should be democracy. Deng Xiaoping said, yeah, it didn't happen. But basically, this is the beginning of the drive to introduce some market reforms into China to establish the free trade zones, to uh, stop being autarkic, that is trying to have a closed economy and to reach out, uh, participate in world trade. You should be familiar with all that from the first unit. Uh, under his successor, Zhang Zemin, you have, I love this, the three represents, or sometimes called the three stresses. Uh, so the Communist Party needs to represent China's advanced productive forces. What that translates into common speak, plain speak, is that economic growth trumps everything else, and that if you're a good engineer or run a business well, well, you can become a good communist and join the party. We welcome you. The onward direction of China's advanced culture. In other words, China needs to establish its world leadership to show that it's the Middle Kingdom again. Nationalism is going to be more important than ideology. We saw Stalin do that. We see Putin doing that. Uh, very attractive uh, approach for, you know, a authoritarian regimes trying to maintain popular legitimacy. So the hosting of the Olympics in 2008 was a good example of that. Uh, and 
uh, the Communist Party should represent the fundamental interests of the overwhelming majority of the Chinese people. That does not sound very revolutionary. In fact, it was because Marxist theory didn't claim that communists should represent all the people. They should represent the proletariat, the the working classes, or uh, to extend it to Mao's analysis, the peasantry. Now, now again, if you're if you are developing a business successful in world trade, uh, operating in the world economy, you are welcome to be in the party, and that's what that meant. Hu Jintao, you had the charmingly named, maintain the advanced nature of CCP members, and I looked at that several different places. That's apparently what his rectification campaign was called. Uh, at this point, the corruption, the uh, prebendalist use of state resources for personal uh, enrichment was causing more and more you know, unrest within the country. Essentially, this was an effort to um, I mean, I'm trying to think of how to put this best. I mean, it was it was much more of an emphasis on not being blatantly corrupt, uh, not raising concerns than it was about attempting to have real reforms in the uh, in party members' use of state resources, basically as plunder. Okay, now earlier in the, or really within the last year and a half, uh, Xi has raised a lot of concerns by suddenly quoting Mao Zedong and talking about a new mass line campaign and, you know, energizing the base. Since he was the son of a revolutionary, there was a concern that maybe he was going to be returning to Maoist times. Uh, and his big campaign is to weed out the four undesirable work styles. I am not making this up. Formalism, bureaucratism, hedonism, and extravagance. And formalism is a tough term, but it was one that was used by Mao. This was one of the reasons that people thought that he was harking back to Mao. Uh, China has a tradition of formalism. It used to be that one rose in the bureaucracy through an examination system. Uh, it's the idea of being rigid, of not being flexible and responding to conditions. Uh, it's really probably in the way that Xi is formulating it, also bureaucratism and the idea that party officials are running bureaucracies for their own interests. They're angering the people. Hedonism is basically just being too apparently wealthy, extravagant, similarly. So here's my favorite. He has a campaign. One soup, four dishes only at banquets. No more of these huge banquets. Uh, Ramey Martin reported that brandy sales dropped 30% in a year in China and not as much heavy drinking at these party meetings. And, and this alarmed a lot of people, uh, there was a revival of self-criticism meetings. But there's a really interesting article um, in December, that's December 2013, in the New York Times about this. I'm just going to read a little section of it. Uh, it's describing one of these meetings. So the 10 middle-aged officials who gathered in a nondescript government office in southwestern China last month were assigned a highly fraught mission. Highlight one another's faults and confess any transgressions that might undermine the Communist Party's credibility among the masses. Officially, nothing was off limits. Supervisors could be criticized. A colleague's affinity for expensive jewelry was fair game. Even voicing opposition to the central leadership's policy was permitted. The chief of the officials bureau spoke first, confessing he was a little hasty and might push others too hard. Recalled one attendee who asked not to be identified to avoid retribution. And when it came time for the rest of those present to speak, each carefully imitated the chief's innocuous critique in a pantomime of remorse that left everyone unscathed. The official explained afterward, there's no guarantee what you say in a meeting won't be used against you, so the best way to avoid problems is to follow the leaders. Wielded with often violent results in the days when Mao Zedong was China's paramount leader, criticism and self-criticism sessions have been resurrected by President Xi Jinping as the most powerful weapon for rallying the Communist Party and the Chinese people behind his push to liberalize the economy while maintaining the party's control over this nation of 1.3 billion people. Uh, 
The sessions are officially known as Democratic Life Meetings for their ostensibly open atmosphere, but they take place behind closed doors. At any rate, that sounds like uh, Chinese business as usual, but with a bit of a Maoist overlay to to expand popular. And this is a very Maoist scene. This is Xi with uh, young uh, young communist youth, uh, the kind of scene that Mao Zedong loved. This really looks like a lot of the Mao posters, but I don't think we're seeing a resurrection of Mao. So, huge debate among China watchers about just what the reform proposals issued at the third plenum war. And by the way, there's a lot of disagreement. Very interesting is, you know, to read about this. There are some people who think that this could be very significant and some people who are very skeptical. Uh, if the reform proposals as stated go forward, they will in fact be significant, but there are reasons to be skeptical. So let me just go over this quickly. Um, lots of attention was paid to a statement that the role of the market in allocating resources would now be considered decisive rather than basic. This is the centerpiece of what most people think that G is hoping to accomplish. You've got these big, bulky state enterprises that drain resources, that are sources of corruption, that misallocate resources, and more private companies should be doing this. So, for example, one announcement is that 30% of the profits from state-owned enterprises will now be remitted to the central government. Uh, the idea is that they can't just accumulate cash. On the other hand, if they're making that much money, you know, why are they making that much money? And are they just getting government subsidies? Uh, small and medium private banks will be permitted uh, and general loosening up of the financial system that is very important for China's continued economic development. There were some important social reform announcements. China has notorious labor camps. These are going to be abolished. The big question mark is whether they'll be recreated under a different name. Uh, China's uh, death penalty, which is very widely and cruelly used, will be subject to a step-by-step -step reduction in the number of crimes that are considered capital crimes are subject to the death penalty. This has gotten a lot of attention. The one-child policy will be eased somewhat. It used to be that a couple could only have two children. If each of them was an only child, now only one of them has to be an only child. And by the way, this is really a fairly realistic response to China's belatedly waking up to the fact that it's moving toward a labor shortage. Eased residency permits to move from the countryside to the city. These are incredibly unpopular, incredibly controversial, uh, but this is going to lead to a huge fight because towns are not eager to have a huge influx of rural residents and local bosses in the rural areas love the control that the residency permits give them over the people. So one of the biggest things to watch is whether real reform occurs in this area. Uh, the Chinese Communist parties announced that more social organizations or NGOs will be allowed. And this will be very interesting to see. Putin has cracked down dramatically on these, and China historically has as well, particularly any of them with foreign uh, influences, particularly, for instance, international environmental groups. Most of the speculation about this is that China's got this aging population. It has fewer children to take care of their parents. Uh, the old social organization is falling apart. You don't have a social network like Social Security to take its place. And China is thinking we've got to get some help looking after all these elderly poor people. Maybe social organizations are the way to go. This is also going to be very interesting to watch. This could be very important. Uh, separating the judiciary from local political control. China's courts are notoriously corrupt. Uh, again, uh, the local po politicians are not going to hand over this control easily. This is going to be very interesting to look at in a few years and see what's happened. Uh, and as for announcements for political changes, there weren't any. So what are the prospects for reform? Well, there are some reasons to think uh, that this is a sincere effort for reform and would be pursued vigorously. It's absolutely clear that there is an overcapacity in state-owned enterprises, that it's a drag on the Chinese economy, it's pulling needed resources away from more productive uses, and it's a huge source of the corruption problem. There's also an understanding that China has overinvested 
uh, in capital and underinvested in consumption. And to, to continue to grow the way it has for the last few decades, it's going to have to move to a more consumption-oriented economy. China's been saying this for a long time, though, and we haven't actually seen it happen much. And a consumption-oriented economy requires a much freer market because basically businesses have to be free to respond to changes in consumer demand. And there's also a recognition that the one-child policy has produced a labor shortage and a socially skewed population, by which I mean a lot more boys than girls, and that this has become a problem. It's also very unpopular because of the draconian measures taken, the forced late-term abortions, etc. And here are some reasons to be skeptical about reform. Uh, the plenum document said very little about reducing the subsidies to state-owned enterprises. It said that market forces would be important, uh, but it doesn't talk about letting state-owned enterprises go bankrupt, and it continues to have language about how uh, state-owned enterprises will play a main role in the economy. China watchers are engaging, you know, spilling a lot of ink uh, or gigabytes or whatever on, you know, which words are more important here, the, you know, the the important, the new, more important role of the market or the main role of SOEs. We'll just have to wait and see. Uh, so China has stepped up pressure on foreign multinationals. There are a lot of ways they can make life uncomfortable for foreign-owned businesses. The Huku system of residence permits is not being dismantled. So it's not saying that people can move about freely. It's just allowing more people to move to urban areas, and the state still says where they can move. So this is not a free market in labor. Uh, and these residency permits and uncertain property rights, particularly in rural areas, remain a huge source of, of local party power. By the way, I should have added that reforms to rural property rights is another proposal that's being made. Could be very significant, but there's going to be a lot of political opposition uh, because it's a source of local political power, basically having having control over local land. Uh, Chinese courts have been handing down very heavy sen sentences against protesters, especially uh, people whose protests have taken place in social media, which scares the Chinese leaders a lot. So, for example, there's a new citizens movement, which is a major anti-corruption movement, seems to have a lot of followers. Uh, the leader was just sentenced to four years in prison. Uh, China has also continued to crack down on foreign media reports. And something I find kind of depressing is that a number of these uh, agencies, Google, for example, not really a press agency, but of course an internet search engine, Bloomberg, Business Week, et cetera, have uh, apparently pulled stories in order to be able to continue to operate in China. And so, you know, basically Western press is giving in to Chinese notions of press freedom. Uh, and I thought this was very interesting that uh, government officials are being required to, doc to watch a documentary about the collapse of the Soviet Union and the huge mistake that Gorbachev allegedly made by moving too quickly toward reform and by promoting political reform. This doesn't sound like somebody eager to embrace reform. Okay, elections. Uh, elections are mostly controlled by the party, highly orchestrated, uh, really choreographed. There is some freedom. The only real elections are at the uh, county level. And in some cases, the local Communist Party does allow relatively free elections. And the reason for that, apparently, at least what commentators seem to say, is that the Communist Party does need to find its most talented people. And the people who are well regarded locally, it's a source of information, basically. And since that's the only level at which elections are held, the county level, some of those are allowed to be free. How free they are often depends on who's the local or regional or county party boss. Um, so, and there are nominations by the people. Again, it's been an opportunity for local talent to rise and local talent with popular support. Given the widespread anger at corruption, we may see more of this because there is some eagerness on the part of the party uh, to have popular people identified. Uh, in 1987, um, the Communist Party initiated village uh, elections to village committees. And the reason for this straightforwardly was that rural China was moving into revolt. And we are still seeing thousands of rural revolts, revolts in China. I have a friend who's been a foreign service officer, served in China several times. And he, he thinks that there is a serious danger that China will, in fact, 
disintegrate under the force of rural discontent. And he says that we have no idea how many of these take place. Uh, but there was a very prominent protest in the village of Wukan in September 2011, and it's still getting news and still the most prominent example of this, partly just because it really got out in the press. So you have a southern fishing village uh, in China's most important manufacturing and export region, uh, and the protest erupted over illegal land grabs by local officials. I mentioned that uh, land law in the rural areas is a subject of huge dispute, generates a great deal of anger, and it's a source of local party power and enrichment. Uh, and basically, this village broke free of China, more or less. It set up a foreign press office with its own generator. Uh, you know, the reports of what were happening went out on the internet with videos. It got a lot of attention worldwide, uh, and it escalated when the protest leader died in police custody, allegedly a heart attack. Nobody believed that. So they set up defense committees, patrols against security forces. This was looking like a proletariat revolution. This scared the Chinese leadership. It went viral on the internet, so it was harder to ignore. So how was Beijing going to respond? Well, one thing is it heightened the debate within the party. What are we going to do to address social unrest? Do we crack down or do we make concessions? And they chose both. Um, but part of the emphasis on uh, ending ostentatious ostentation, you know, don't have too many courses at your banquet, don't be too obviously corrupt, was really a response uh, to this protest and similar protests. Uh, there was a recognition that government land grabs in the cities uh, are angering uh, the middle class. Land values are inflated. It's a huge issue. It's the major source of wealth for many uh, urban middle class Chinese. And these are people with a lot more political and economic resources than the rural revolters in Wukan. Could the villagers use the legal system to redress grievances? It's a notoriously corrupt legal system. And what about the political system? Will the government move quickly on new land laws? They've said they're going to. Uh, some of this slide is left over from an earlier update. I probably should have updated it more. But basically, there's still a real question mark about how far the leadership will move in land reforms. Uh, there was a good NPR story on Oh, I should say, but the final option, of course, is to try to use the political process. And there were lively village elections in Wukan. And to find out what happened, this is a good story. Oh, okay. I should have probably not kept this slide in, but this is how the government did respond. So they stonewalled initially, then they made more concessions than usual. They released the jailed protesters. They promised to return the body. The villagers then said that they would go along. Uh, and the Beijing leadership responded, the Wukan incident shows we should raise social management to a more important position. Da, 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 da. Note the language, though, they're talking about social management, not democracy, diffusing social conflicts, not addressing them. OK, sorry, I didn't hadn't realize I left that slide in, but it actually it was informative. Uh, interest groups, linkage uh, institutions, traditionally these are corporatist as they were in Mexico uh, before the opening up to, to more democratic systems after 2000 or in the late 1990s and after 2000. Uh, so the Communist Party created and controlled various corporatist interest groups. The Youth League is an example of a very powerful one. There has been some growth in civil society in recent years. Activist groups have opposed government sponsored dam projects, for example, and the environment has been the area where civil society has been most successful. So uh, almost a third of the National Party Congress delegates voted against the Three Gorges Dam. I mean, that was a very unusual rebellion against the party line. Uh, but in most cases, uh, the Chinese articulate their interests personally. They develop personal ties through Guangxi, and they rely on party bosses to fix, which of course means uh, that corruption and government control of the economy uh, is reinforced. Now, the internet is a big question mark over China because it's increasingly an alternative source of communication and mobilization. China is very aware of that. They're trying very hard to control the internet, but as you know, the internet is hard to control. Uh, China is, as I mentioned, allowing more non-governmental organizations. They're hoping that they're going to play more of a role in social welfare. Uh, religious groups, though, particularly Falun Gong, which is a kind of odd 
Uh, it's actually an exercise movement with spiritual overtones. I don't really understand it very well, but there have been major crackdowns on it. Somewhat more tolerance of Buddhism and Christianity, but, but only within strict limits. Now, the environment is going to be the real test case uh, for social capital and the role of interest groups. Uh, China is a huge polluter. So here's some statistics here. It emits almost twice as much carbon dioxide as the next biggest polluter, the U.S. Air pollutants in Beijing are 40 times what the World Health Organization considers safe. China only got around to establishing an environmental protection agency in 2008. But... Just a couple of weeks ago, in fact, China issued new rules requiring enterprises, major enterprises, to publish details, basically, of their waste production. How honest these reports will be, whether these reports will be investigated remains to be seen. But this is an area where the leadership is very well aware that there's a lot of public anger. Here's a Pew poll result showing it ranks fourth as a concern after inflation, corruption, and inequality. But it's actually been rising in the polls. And so the question is, will this empower NGOs? How will they respond? And of course, how will the government respond? Mass media, like everything else, the basic, uh, the bottom line is that the party controls it, particularly as in Russia, broadcast media. The Chinese Communist Party, a lot like Vladimir Putin's United Russia, is actually willing to allow a lot of freedom among the print media on the theory that only a few pointy heads uh, read print media, books, newspapers, anyway, magazines. And although the print media has exploded in China, most of it's non-political, huge expansion, you know, sports magazines, fashion magazines, movie stars, etc. Uh, and there's a more scholarly media, which is more free. Uh, academic exchanges become somewhat free. But again, this is among the pointy heads. This is not as much a concern uh, with the Chinese leadership as the masses. Um, polls show a majority of Chinese say they never talk about politics. They don't particularly support democracy. They care about economic growth. Uh, they care about whether their property is being seized. They're mad about corruption. Um, but there does not seem to be a huge demand, maybe among university students, but not really from any other source for democracy, perhaps at the village level. Uh, the Internet remains the main alternative information source. These are actually China's own statistics. Uh, they have 618 million Internet users, and they spend an average of 18.7 hours a week online. Internet is big in China. Bloggers and web page hosts have to re register with the government, and it's gone to huge effort uh, to create firewalls and to take things off the Internet. They can't be completely successful. You've got all those smart 19-year-old hackers or 16-year-old hackers. Uh, hard to beat them. But hackers receive severe prison sentences unless they're hacking in uh, to Western corporations or government sites, in which case my guess is that they... Uh, and get, get awarded gold stars by the government. Very good recent article in the Wall Street Journal about the crackdown on social media, which also tells you a lot about what's going on in China today.